Hello and welcome to the High Maintenance Hippie Podcast. This is your host, Ashley from Ashley Taylor Wellness. On this podcast, we talk about all things beauty, health, wellness, and optimization. Being a high maintenance hippie represents not being boxed in, as I strongly believe that one size does not fit all. I'm a nurse turned coach and I have learned so much about both conventional and alternative options and I want to help you expand your options. I'm here to inspire you to learn new ways to improve your quality of life and to take your power back. I'm so excited that you're here. So let's get started. Hello and welcome back to the High Maintenance Hippie Podcast. Today's guest is Sarah Kleiner from Sarah Kleiner Wellness. She's on Instagram, YouTube, and I absolutely love her and her content. So I'm really excited to get to know you a little bit better today, Sarah. But she focuses on circadian health and ancestral living. So can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got into this? And thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've been, it's funny, I think I started following you maybe a couple years ago and just, yeah, it's, it, we kind of commented back and forth. And so it's cool to actually just finally get to chat with you, not just on Instagram. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for having me. I really got into just the online space by accident. I was dealing with a lot of health issues in 2019, a lot of inflammation, a lot of stuff that I had thought was gone. And it kind of was all coming back to me. I think a lot of it was stress related. And it was actually the end of 2018. And a good friend of mine, who's a functional medicine doctor was like, Hey, you know, I can run a bunch of labs for you and do the whole, you know, the functional medicine thing. It's going to be really expensive and and take a look at things for you. Or you might want to try this carnivore diet thing um, and see if it helps you. And I was like, that is literally the most insane, ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm, I was also a yoga teacher. I I taught yoga for 13 years. I quit after 2020. That's a whole other story. (laughs) And then my son being born stopped really teaching, but uh, I did teach for 13 years. And so, you know, really plant-based that sort of lifestyle. I wasn't plant-based at the time I was eating a little bit of meat, but I just was having a, like a whole bunch of issues. And so I said, that's really crazy. But then I got to a point of desperation Mm -hmm. as a yoga teacher. I couldn't even practice the way that I wanted to. I was in so much joint pain and just awful. And so finally I was like, all right, I'm going to try this. What, what, what do I literally have to lose? And I started a carnivore diet in January, 2019 within a couple of weeks every issue that I was having was pretty much gone. You know, my stomach was totally flat. I had looked pregnant all the time. My joint pain was pretty much gone. I was back to doing like really like fun athletic yoga, the way I left, love to do it. And I was like, what the heck? This is like some kind of craziness. And I, at the end of the 30 days, my depression, anxiety, all those issues were totally gone. And I had struggled with that stuff like my whole life. And I started this Instagram page kind of as a joke called carnivore yogi. Um, oh, that was you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I started it totally as a joke, like, cause I just wanted to follow other people doing carnivore and like kind of yeah. motivate myself to keep going. Cause I was feeling so good, but it is a really hard thing to maintain, you know, cause no one else, no one else is doing it, you know, in, your, in most people's lives. And so my page kind of went viral. Didn't expect that to happen. Had like 10,000 followers, like really quickly. And then I had people all over the world reaching out to me, like, how do I do this diet? I went and got certified in nutrition and started studying under a bunch of people and just learning everything that I could. I'd already been like doing a lot of coaching through my yoga business for years and years. And so coaching wasn't new, but the nutrition piece was. And so, yeah, I I did that. And uh, (laughs) that's how I really got started in the online space, doing a podcast, doing YouTube, doing everything. And then fast forward to uh, the end of 2020, you know, 2020, I think changed a lot of things for a lot of people. That's when I decided to, you know, I didn't go back. I wasn't teaching yoga. I did everything online and I decided I wanted to have another baby at the age of, I think I was 41 at the time. And I was like, oh, I really want to have another baby. I've, you know, I have a daughter with severe non-speaking autism with a lot of issues. And we've just put off the second child for years. It's going to get easier. It's going to get easier. It never got easier. And I was like, I'm 41. Like if we don't do this now, it is not going to happen. And so I got pregnant right away and was like, wow, this is easy and lost that baby. And then yeah. got pregnant again, lost that one. And then, you know, started going to down the route of 
fertility doctors, functional medicine doctors, all this stuff spent like over a hundred thousand dollars between IVF and functional medicine supplements, like IVs, ozone, ozone, like everything did everything. And two failed rounds of IVF and was just devastated and stumbled upon the work of Dr. Cruz. And it was actually someone that had been following me for a long time, reached out to me and was like, Hey, do you want to interview Dr. Jack Cruz? I can hook you up with him. And I was like, yeah, I would love to. Sure. I've heard about him before, but I don't really know a lot about his stuff. And the funny thing is that my friend, her name's Dr. Remka. She's the one who recommended that I do the carnivore diet in the first place. She lives a few miles from me. Wow. We're we're good friends. Yeah. And she was the one who recommended I do the carnivore diet. Well, when she recommended I do the carnivore diet, she also recommended I start going out and looking at sunrise every day, start wearing blue blockers at night. So she introduced me to a lot of cruises, you know, (laughs) theories, work, all of that in 2019. But I thought, that's stupid. Like that is so stupid. Why would I do that? I just want to focus on the diet and the diet did great for me until I was trying to get pregnant and my hormones were not optimal. I had gained weight, you know, even being restrictive and fasting, I had gained like 20 pounds and I was like, but I have this whole online carnivore platform. So I got to keep rolling with, you know, but it was the baby and wanting to get pregnant that changed everything for me. And when I interviewed Dr. Cruz, he was like, Hey, you know, if you are wanting to get pregnant, you need to learn about leptin, the hormone leptin, and you have to start light has to start being more important to you than this carnivore diet and the food stuff. And again, I was at that point of desperation because I really wanted this baby that I said, okay, I'm doing it. I'm doing it all. I hooked up with some of his kind of proteges, people that have studied his work a lot that are now like really good friends of mine and part of my community. And just dove head first into it, you know, I was out in my pajamas every morning, looking at sunrise, started studying leptin, understanding that eating breakfast every day, shifting in, eating local seasonal foods instead of strict carnivore and plen- cold plunging, which I was like, get a cold plunge to get pregnant. What? You know, start grounding as often as I could. It kind of became like a game to me. Like how much can I be outside? How much light can I get? How much of this can I just really just do? And I met with Dr. Cruz in September of 2021, dove into everything, went, you know, totally quantum circadian and was uh, in January, I actually went to my doctor and did like baseline hormones. And she was like, well, I don't know. Your estrogen's a bit high. I'll probably see you back again next month for IVF. Cause I had decided, well, I'll just go do another round of IVF if I can't do this on my own. But I had also started kind of embracing a lot of the quantum mindset, like a lot of Joe Dispenza and a lot of visualization. Mm -hmm. And I was like, screw this, I'm getting pregnant. And January, 2022, I got pregnant. And then I had my son in October, 2022 at the age of 43. And yeah, he just turned one a few weeks ago. And I have really just transformed the way I view health and everything because of this experience. And I've really you know, the way that I help people as well as a coach and what I teach is really more based around the circadian and ancestral principles rather than like carnivore diet or even just like diet period. Like it has to be like a full lifestyle, you know? Yeah. I mean, all of that really resonates. And it's so interesting. You bring up Dr. Rimka. I don't know her personally, but I believe she's good friends with my Chinese medicine doctor that I first saw in 2016. So when I, it was 2015, I was still back in North Carolina and I knew that there was more I could do for my health. And I worked in the hospital, a very well-known reputable Mm -hmm. hospital, but I was really struggling. And I thought a lot of it was night shift. Anyway, I met with him and he told me all these things. He was really big on light. There was this almost like a photon light. I think it was the one from sauna space Mm. and he wanted me to use that. I was like, this man, I don't know. I thought I was so out there, you know, coffee enemas, all these things. And I just was like, all right, I'm not too sure. But anyway, I saw him at the biohacking conference and I've seen him at many conferences with Dr. Rimka and I believe they're very good friends. So it's just so interesting because did you have that same reaction of like, I don't know, this seems a little strange or a little out there or- Mm -hmm but I'm willing to try it. I just thought it was too simple to actually work. 
Like, okay. And yeah. I think that's what a lot of people think. It's like yes. grounding and sunlight and light exposure. Like it's too simple, you know, cold exposure. It's, I need, I need like a supplement formula or right. a specific diet or a really complicated protocol in order to improve my health. And I think that's, that was my mental block. And I think that's a mental block for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but you get, you have to get to that point of desperation where you've tried the expensive supplement protocols and the special diets and all the things, and it's not working. And you're like, okay, well, literally what do I have to lose by going outside barefoot and like looking at the sun <laughs> and wearing blue blockers at night and getting in some ice water and, you know, like, what do I have to lose by doing these things? You know? Exactly. And so when I get confused about health and wellness, because as I'm sure, you know, there are so many different things and something I really respect about you side note is that there have been times where we don't see eye to eye and mm -hmm. with curiosity, we'll say, Hey, wh where are you coming from? And I've never once felt this like hostile energy of like, you have to mm -hmm. think like me. It's just always mm -hmm. been curiosity. I love that so much about you. Thank so you. of course it's, it really is something I respect so much because many practitioners and just people are very strong and like, this is the only way, but you're not, I mean, even though this is what you believe in and it's worked for you, you're not forcing other people or shaming other people. You're just like, mm -hmm. this is what works for me. And just like you said, it's what are we losing by these free things right. and what we value in society is often what we pay for not necessarily what is free. There is no billboard for the sun. We are skipping the foundations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not against supplement protocols, but right. if you're not sleeping, if you're not doing things, you know, you're doing a lot of things that are harmful, which we'll get into later, like watching TV and murder shows right before bed and wondering right. why you're not sleeping through the night, <laughs> exactly. or having a pint of ice cream before bed, and then waking up at two in the morning, or there could be so many things, but without that foundation, the protocol isn't going to work the supplement protocol, the way that it's intended to. So mm -hmm. what you're doing is teaching people, the foundations, the basics, and that might even be enough for some people where they get to not have to do some of those protocols. Mm -hmm. And that's really powerful and might trigger some people that perhaps benefit from sharing those protocols. And I'm not saying they're not helpful, but what you're doing is really foundational. And I don't see how everyone couldn't benefit from experimenting with some of these things. Yeah. I mean, it's like no harm to try these things out and yeah, it's, I've seen so many amazing transformations at this point. I have a private membership group and I have courses that teach people how to do this kind of in the modern world, because it isn't second nature to most of us, but I've had people that I'm like, I, you know, if you want to try it, go for it. You know, people with like complicated cancers and just like really scary health situations do this stuff and have miraculous results. And so every day I'm kind of like in awe of I'm like, yeah, I know it works, but seeing like how well it works mm -hmm. is, it just continues to blow me away. Yeah. It's really amazing. So let's compare a circadian lifestyle to a typical day as a standard American living their mm -hmm. diet and lifestyle in a, in a certain way. So let's say your average person uh, wakes up because their alarms having beep, mm -hmm. beep, beep, something stressful. Yep looking at phone, probably scrolling through emails. What do I have to do today? What do I have to do today? I'm going to have my coffee. I'm going to rush out the door. Definitely not looking at sunlight. Definitely not being intentional. Mm -hmm. I'm just hitting the ground running and I'll probably get to work, maybe have some uh, sugary breakfast or some pie mm -hmm. or whatever's there under fluorescent lighting. Mm -hmm. I'll be inside all day. I'm just thinking about even the hospital days inside. I'd go to work when it was dark in the winter, leave when it was dark come home, watch some TV, go to bed, do it all over again. So right. I'm taking fancy supplements. Why am I not getting better? Right. Exactly. That's, that's the problem. And you don't really realize it until you kind of start living this lifestyle, how different it is. I, I had to do a little weekend trip and stayed at my aunt and uncle's house a couple of weeks. Actually that was, yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago. And <laughs> you know, I have my blue blockers. I had all the things and they're like, you know, you get so sensitive to the overhead lights and you get so like yes. kind of hyper aware of how different things are. Because for me, you know, and I always had to wake up with an alarm. Actually, I've had kids for 
almost 16 years now. So I haven't really needed an alarm. Usually it is the kids that wake me up, but you know, most people are waking up with an alarm. And once you start doing this circadian piece where you are waking up with the sun, you, you start to just naturally wake up that way. And you, most people sleep with blackout curtains and the whole nine, but they might need an alarm maybe the first three days. But once your body starts sinking, right? Like you get that sunrise in your naked eyes in the morning, and then you're putting on the blue blockers after sunset, typically within three days for people, their body naturally begins to wake with the sunrise. And that happens all year round because what most people don't even realize until we get to like daylight savings time or daylight savings time ends, like it is this next weekend, mm-hmm. people don't really realize like, oh, the sun kind of comes up at a little bit of a different time every single day. It's like correcting every day. It's either a little bit earlier every day or a little bit later in the day, it, depending on the time of year. But once you begin to live the circadian lifestyle, I would say, most people that do my courses that do this stuff, they are waking up naturally with the sun within three days. Some people, it takes a little longer if they have a significant sleep debt or sleep issues that they're working with or chronic health issues. But a lot of times it's that fast. And so that's the biggest piece. And if you do like in the week, so we're, like I said, the days are getting real short nights are getting longer over here where I live on the East coast. I keep blue blockers beside my nightstand and just pop those on Mm -hmm. if I have to be around the house doing stuff before the sun comes up and then sun comes up, blue blockers go off. I'm outside, even with the baby, even with my daughter, like that's just the lifestyle, you know, and people that have to leave and go to work. I have a lot of clients like that. I'll have them do the same thing, but as they're driving to work, take the blue blockers off and don't wear orange or red when you're driving only yellow, please don't ever (laughs) wear red or orange blue blockers things. behind the wheel. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. But I'll have them wear the yellow blue blockers while driving. And then if the sun's coming up while they're driving, then open the sunroof or crack the window. That's all you really need just to get that signal. If you have to get to work before sunrise, keep the yellow blue blockers on. And then if you can take a little five minute break at sunrise, and then again at UVA, perfect. And that's really all your body needs. And so Just those pieces are when you start to live more of a circadian lifestyle, those pieces just become a lot more crucial once you understand what it does for your hormones and how it impacts all this, the, your endocrine system and every single cell in your body has a circadian clock in front of it. Once you understand that piece, and then you start to feel the effects of it, you really start to take this light piece a lot more seriously. Yeah. At the biohacking conference in October, 2017, I was told that light is responsible for up to 80% of our biology. Yes. I really struggled with that. I'm like, really? Yeah. Really? 80%. It kind of went in one ear and out the other, but I uh, got my first red light device then. And I did some tests and my mitochondrial function was so bad. Let's just say out of a hundred, it was like eight out of a hundred. And then I got it up to, from my most recent test, I will say like 85 out of a hundred. So major improvement. And I have been very cognizant about light. The one time that I'm naughty is when I'm recording podcasts. I have some artificial light. light. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I've got to figure out uh, something for that. And when I worked in the hospital, just like you were saying about the blue blockers. Fluorescent lights in the hospital are crazy. It's terrible. I mean, I felt so drained and depleted. Mm -hmm. And of course it could be minerals. It could be other things, but we don't think about how that light affects us on a cellular level. Mm-hmm. And I agree though, because the yellow ones, I use raw optics. I don't know if mm-hmm. you use them or another yep, company. I use raw. Yep. Okay. I use raw optics and Viva rays, but I use the yellow raw optics specifically because they block out more of the blue and green than the Viva rays do. Cause there's a, there's a whole little theory, like uh controversy between the two companies about Ooh. that whole deal. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Rudy's a good friend of mine and I work with Viva Rays. They're one of my podcast sponsors, but he says that his yellows, they don't block out as much. They let a little bit of blue and green in because you need a little bit of blue and green during the day Mm -hmm. so that you're keep healthy cortisol levels. That's based on the work of Dr. Samar, Samar Hatar, I think is his name. And that you know, you need a little bit of blue and green during the day. So don't wear yellows that block all of that out. So I tell people to go with how they feel, but that's why I use the raw yellows 
because I do feel better when I block all of that out. Yes. Yeah. So I use uh, the style is Clyde, but Clyde Maxwell. I, I prefer- like the Nate lenses. Which one? Oh, I don't think I know what those are. Do they if have metal? Ha- if they still had, no. Mm-mm. Okay. If he still has them, but yeah. So I choose not to have metal frames just because mm. I think about, is that an extra piece of oh, yeah. metal near the my EMF. head? Yeah, yes. absolutely. So yeah. if I can do plastic even better. Yeah. His and, are, I think the plastic. Yes. So when I was, I, I was like, okay, here's a good hack. I'm working in the hospital. I'm just going to wear my blue blockers. But when it came to patient assessment and I'm looking at wounds oh, yeah. and things you like that to take them off, I had to take yeah. them off. So I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that about driving. Obviously the, there are just so many nuances mm, so um, many. and blue light is not all bad. So right. good point. You know, we right. need some during the day. So when are we naturally being exposed to you know, what are the different spectrums of light that we're being exposed to on a daily basis? So people can understand it's not that blue light is bad, but we wouldn't want to consume it at midnight because that's not when Mm -hmm. we're consuming it in nature. Mm -hmm. So could you explain that for people a little bit? Yeah. So blue light tells your body make cortisol essentially just to keep it like super, super simple. And the amount of blue light that is in sunrise tell it kind of starts to turn on that hormone system, right? So you've got sunrise first and then the UVA window, which is next. And that blue light kind of increases as the day goes with your cortisol. Like, so our cortisol is in this pattern because a lot of people like, oh, I have high cortisol and people kind of misunderstand how cortisol works. Like it's supposed to kind of just go up, rise, then go down and then melatonin kicks in at night and cortisol and melatonin oppose one another. So you don't, that's why you don't want overhead lights, a bunch of, you know, stimulating TV, that phone screen in your eyes after dark, because that's going to block your body from making melatonin, which is a master antioxidant, which is responsible for helping you heal autophagy, apoptosis, all that stuff. Now we can make melatonin on cellular melatonin, subcellular melatonin in response to uh, near infrared light. Uh, which is available. It's like 42% of the sun spectrum when we're outdoors or a red light panel. Right. But going back to your blue light question, essentially the amount of blue light changes throughout the day. And it's also balanced out with red, violet, like all the other colors of the sunlight spectrum. Right. And so we never in nature are supposed to have this like blast of, of unfiltered blue light that I think our phone screen is like, 5,700 Kelvins. That's the intensity of the phone screen TVs. That intensity of blue light is present in summer solstice at noon, right? So like noon in June is what you're telling your brain when you wake up and you look directly at your phone. So I think that's why it's so bad because again, that, that amount of blue light and that intensity of blue light is going to tell your body, you need to make X amount of cortisol to keep up with this like noon in June rhythm. So it's really, really dysregulating to people's cortisol patterns, which affects all the downstream hormones. You know, we talk, Oh, I want to raise my progesterone or lower my estrogen or boost this hormone. We, we, if your cortisol is jacked up because you're blasting yourself with blue light all the time, you can do all the adaptogens and like supplements and Vitex and I'm going to eat this food to boost this more. It's Jack. It's not going to do what you need it to do. If you don't get your light, right. You you Mm -hmm. might get a little progress, but you're not going to get all the way where you want to go. If you're still giving your body that really confusing signal. Mm -hmm. So would you say that less blue light in the morning, more of the infrared red Mm -hmm. spectrums, Mm -hmm. and that's why we're not going to typically burn early in the morning because it's infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye. Yeah, it's well, it's red. So infrared is, is all day pretty much it's 42%. So infrared's there, but we, what we don't burn because the UV index is not high enough. Mm -hmm. That's what causes us to burn is when that UV index gets up high. Right. So during winter time where I live in Atlanta, we still have UVB available, which is how we synthesize vitamin D or hormone D. But the UV index, when it's like the dead of winter only gets to like two. So if I wanted to make vitamin D, I'd have to like lay outside in the cold for hours on end. Right. So it's, it's the UV index. Like, so if you are in, let's say Miami, 
UV index gets up 13, you know, gets up pretty high. That's where we burn. And that happens like in the middle of the day. Okay. So that's, yeah. But getting your, sinking your body to the the red and the, you know, sunrise, it's kind of like preconditions your skin for sun. And then seeing the sun in sequential order is a good way again, to prep your body to have some of that stronger UVB in the middle of the day so that you can make more vitamin D and that your body, so you don't burn as easily. Now there's a nuanced conversation. I think that needs to be had about okay. sun. My partner, Carrie Bennett, we run our fertility course together and she's somebody that helped me when I was going through my fertility journey. And she's just a brilliant, brilliant lady. I love her. Is that Carrie B wellness? Mm-hmm. Love her stuff. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. She's that you two a, she's together. amazing. Yeah. We have a podcast called quantum conversations Okay, and uh, we talk about all this stuff, kind of like how can the everyday person understand and implement this? And so this week we're going to meet tomorrow. We're going to talk about nuance around the sun because I think everyone's like, sun, you know, sun is good. Sun is bad. It's like this black and white thing. And you kind of get into quantum lifestyle and listening to some of the work of Dr. Cruz and, and some of these other people. And you think I need to be in the sun all day. Like I have to like tan all this, you know, like, and I'm seeing people, they can, you can overdo it. You can, right. ha- you can, yeah, you can burn yourself. You can still get skin cancer. You can still damage your skin. It's a conversation. All this stuff has to be approached with nuance and done with nuance. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I have courses, you know, because people want, I don't have time to coach everybody one-on-one on this stuff and people want to understand and implement this information. So that's what I try to do in all my courses is like, here's how to understand how to implement these things in the modern world. Here's how to not overdo it in the sun here. You know, just here's how to deal with winter. Like I have courses for all that stuff. Amazing. Yeah. And I think you've even gotten some heat before from Mm -hmm. some of your courses. I think the price point's very reasonable. And, you know, some people might say, well, Ashley, don't you do coaching and courses? My goal is to help people find the best option. So Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't come from a place of competition. I want people to find the best of the best. And I think you do such a great job explaining and articulating and, and really practicing what you preach. But why would you get heat from somebody I guess, pun intended with the sun, because once again, these are very foundational things. Why is it causing harm? Is it, why do you think it, someone would have a problem with this type of learning? Well, I get a lot of heat from people that don't, they can't read nuance, right? Okay. Like yeah. that they're just like, or they're like, oh, it's free information. Why are you going to charge for it? I'm like, yeah, then go f- find it and look sure. at it. Then I, yeah. I have like tons of free guides on my website where I've, I have like four or five guides that are like 12 pages long each with scientific studies resources. I mean, I, I put out a ton of free information, but some people want like all this stuff put together and organized yes. in a way they can understand. And so that's what, where the courses come in. And that's why I put those out there. But I think I've gotten heat about the sun before because people don't know how to read the nuance, you know, mm-hmm. and they, I think a lot of people think that I'm saying the sun is not ever going to cause harm for anybody and that it's okay. And they should spend at, like I said, the nuance around it, people are missing that sometimes in my posts. Yes. Need to, I mean, it's like, you can't fit an explanation into an Instagram post for a complicated topic. Sometimes you, right. know, you just can't do it or a reel or a sound bite. If people are always going to um, get upset and they're going to talk about their specific health condition and you didn't address it. And yeah, they live in X, Y, Z area. And it's like, it's really hard to, uh, to, address everybody at all times and get everything hundred percent. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to add on that, okay, sure. You can find these things for free, but Mm -hmm. you can find so many differing perspectives on the same topic. Mm -hmm. So the way that I look at it is this is a person who's implemented this for years now. And at what age were you able to conceive naturally? At 42. And then I gave birth at 43. Okay. So that's amazing. And before that, people might say, oh, you're just lucky or super fertile. Well, well obviously not really. you, had, you had two miscarriages. <laughs> right. And, you know, sending you so much love for that. I, I don't know what that's like, but 
It's so super common though. Like it is. the more that I've shared about it. I mean, I've worked with women that have had five plus or more, you know, mm-hmm. and then we had the two rounds of IVF where we never got any healthy embryos because my eggs were not healthy enough to make a healthy embryo. That's the whole, people think that IVF is like this given like, oh, I can't get pregnant. So I'll just do IVF. And it's not a given. It's very expensive. It's very, very. difficult. You know, a lot of injecting yourself with needles, ultrasounds, blood work, it's intense. And people think, Oh, I'll just do IVF if this doesn't work naturally. Well, that's not a guarantee at all. And like I said, if you don't have healthy eggs or healthy sperm, my husband was very healthy. We tested him of course, and he's super healthy. So the problem was me, but if you don't have healthy eggs, you're not going to IVF is not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. So I think people don't understand that it's not a given and you have to have healthy mitochondria. The mitochondria or what make those healthy eggs. And so that's why what every, everything I do, whether you want to get pregnant or not is based around how do we use a light and, you know, like Jack Cruz says, light magnetism and water. Those are the things that we use to boost mitochondrial function and to create those healthy eggs so that you mm-hmm. can have a healthy baby or that you can have balanced hormones and feel your best regardless. Okay. So it's interesting. You mentioned healthy eggs. Uh, one of the things I sometimes work at a fertility place and I love that they are offering things like NAD and glutathione and even some, uh, B and C vitamins. I believe it's like a Myers cocktail. Mm -hmm. NAD is given to improve the quality of the egg. So how can light help with that? Well, it goes down to this, the signal, right? Your mitochondria are like these sensors and, if you are not giving your body the correct signals, if your mitochondria thinks that you're in danger, you're not going to have the right hormonal balance to make a baby. So it comes down to the signals that your mitochondria are getting because your mitochondria are what impact that hormonal balance. And so you can, I took any, I probably, like I said, a hundred thousand dollars. I did Mm -hmm. ozone. I did blood irradiation therapy. I did, I did, um, the, the mitosin suppositories. I did all of that stuff and it didn't work because my, my mitochondria were not healthy Mm -hmm. and it comes down to cell cleanup, cell repair, autophagy, apoptosis. Are you getting that right? You could do NAD, you could do all these injections or, you know, IVs. And if you're staying up scrolling on your phone every night till 11 o'clock at night, your body's not making any melatonin, your mitochondria are not healthy. And so it's just not going to happen. That cell death and cell repair process is not happening. And so you're not going to get healthy eggs because that's really what it comes down to is Uh, that master antioxidant melatonin, making a ton of that so that you can undergo that process. And you have to have light and you have to have darkness for that, right? Because we've got that subcellular melatonin that the mitochondria make in response to infrared light. Russell Ryder has a lot of great research about that, how that process works. So you get that from getting sunlight during the day or a red light therapy panel. And then at night you need that total darkness and sleep and rest in order to allow melatonin to do what it was naturally meant to do. Yeah. So when you were speaking about looking at our phone and it is like summer midday, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, someone might be listening to this and say, okay, I want summer every day. And while that sounds great, you know, one way I think about it is with hormones, men are on a 24 hour hormonal Mm -hmm. cycle. Women are on a 20 a day, usually hormonal cycle. And so we live in a man's world in the sense that we expect to feel the same every day, you know, nine to five lifestyle, but I really think we live in seasons. We are Mm -hmm. so detached from nature Mm -hmm. and, you know, I still like to get my lashes done and I get my hair done and I do all Mm -hmm. those things, but the more that I can live in harmony with nature, the better that I feel. Right. And that's the piece. I think people just feel so separate. Like bears do that. I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So we have seasons, we have cycles. And is that a part of what you're teaching as well? 110% because our microbiome is completely different in the summer than it is in the winter time. Our hormones are different in the summer and the winter, not only our thyroid hormones, but our sex hormones are different. Like those, that is all very scientifically like proven base. Like I'm not just making this stuff up. 
what happens is that we live in this eternal summer where we have the heat on all the time and we have the overhead lights on all the time. Our bodies are really meant to, in the summertime, get tons of sunlight, make a ton of vitamin D, eat more like foods where, you know, eat more like simple sugar fruits and enjoy that as long as we're leptin sensitive, right? You don't want to be doing that if you have a insulin issue or a leptin issue, which happens first, but really we're meant to be out in the sun barefoot, getting vitamin D in the summer. Winter is supposed to be more scarcity, more fasting, cold, cold can actually do so many amazing things for your mitochondria and darkness. So I always say the hormone of the summer that's dominant in that, you know, part of yours is the hormone D winter is melatonin. We need to be making melatonin and repairing and really living in that cyclical nature, but we don't do that because we got all these modern conveniences and (laughs) it's, but it's wild when I have people start kind of implementing this more of a cyclical seasonal lifestyle, I see things like seasonal depression just go away, you know, and winter weight gain and all these things that people struggle with just vanish, uh, because they're honoring these light and dark cycles. They're honoring seasons and that's the way our bodies were designed. That's the way yes. the mitochondria were designed to operate the most efficiently. Yeah. And, you know, I love NAD treatments. I love a lot of mine is end products. I love my blue blockers. But once again, if you're missing the foundation, then that's going to be an issue. You're not going to get the most out of those things. So some of the components of a circadian lifestyle, my understanding would be sleeping. So mm-hmm. when I go to sleep and when I wake, it does change in the winter versus the mm-hmm. summer. I would say meal timing. And I know you talk a lot Mm -hmm. about that. So I'm big on consistent meal timing for blood sugar. However, there are some nuances here and I, I am not an advocate for fasting. I think there's a time and a place, but just generally speaking for me, I don't like how it makes me feel, but there are Mm -hmm. smarter ways to do it. I don't think women should be eating in a one or two hour fast every single Mm -hmm. day of their cycle, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but let's talk about intermittent fasting or meal timing with a circadian lifestyle. So if I'm pretty sure I've heard you say, if you're only going to eat two meals a day, then you would want it to be breakfast and lunch and Mm -hmm. skipping dinner. Yes. Why is that versus, but I'm not hungry until 12 and six. So why would those two meals be more important to prioritize than the later two? Right. So we have to start thinking about food as an electron, right? Like, and that's how our body, that's the energy currency of the body is electrons, right? And so that is food. That's also light. That's also magnetism. Like we gain electrons through light exposure. We gain like sun exposure, red light exposure. We gain electrons through touching the earth and grounding like that. We pull electrons into our body. So food is just another electron, right? And so you know, we have to, first of all, flip the way we think about food is just like fuel. Yes. But it's our, it's an energy currency to the body and it's not the only one that's important. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at some of the work of Alexander Wunsch, who is actually, I think Matt from raw optics, like his chief scientific advisor, he has some really interesting data on using photons, using light as an energy source and how much of the, yes. the body can actually just primarily rely on photons for energy. So that's super fascinating. So I want to put that out there because people are always going to say that whole thing of like, well, our ancestors did blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, we don't know, <laughs> like we weren't there. We don't, we were, we're not, we don't know what the cavemen actually did. We don't know what our ancestors actually did. We, we were not there. But if we look at, you know, people are saying, oh, hunter gatherers, they didn't, they would go hunt for their food. Well, they were living outdoors connected to the earth. So they're getting all those electrons from the earth. They were living under the sun. They're getting electrons from the sun. They're also drinking mineral rich water from streams and lakes. We don't get that. We don't get all those extra energy sources, right? So if you are living on a beach in Costa Rica or whatever, and you're just getting you in this electron rich environment, sure. Skip breakfast and eat you know, the midday, whatever, like hunter gatherer would, but 99% of people are not doing that. They're living in these like blue lit environments, not seeing sunlight, their hormones are jacked up, they're leptin resistant. And so 
I'm going to tell people see some sunlight, but eat a protein rich breakfast with some fat to balance it out in the morning when you wake up, because you need that to kind of stabilize your cortisol. So it doesn't go way too high and also stabilize your blood sugar. And protein is really important for that leptin signal to occur in the morning. And so that's why I have people not skipping breakfast if they want to practice intermittent fasting, because we want to always prioritize leptin and leptin is impacted by protein. It's impacted by that light signaling and getting that all of it, all that down in the morning. And food is also a zeitgeber, which is a secondary circadian signal. And so when you're getting that light signal and then reinforcing it with food, you're making your circadian rhythm stronger. And like I said, most people have really crappy circadian health, a really crappy relationship with light. And so that's why I, I, in a stressful life, very, most of us have stressful things going on, phones going off all the time, notifying us, uh, jobs. And so sunlight and that breakfast, that's like kind of a non-negotiable for people. If you're not hungry in the morning, when you wake up, it's a sign that your cortisol is probably too high. Your stress hormones are too high. There's a, that's, it's a war, it's an issue. It's a warning sign, but we've kind of glorified it as like, Oh, I'm not hungry in the morning. I'm intermittent fasting. If you want to intermittent fast, skip the dinner, because again, what allows our body to make more melatonin is this kind of scarcity and darkness. And if your body is digesting food, there's a cortisol response happening. And it's not a bad thing because everyone demonizes cortisol, but anytime you eat, you are going to have a little bit of a rise of cortisol. And so you're eating too close to bed. And if your insulin is up, you also can't make melatonin and leptin can't dock to the hypothalamus. So all these like crucial things that need to happen at night for your body to heal and repair. If you're eating too close to bed, uh, you're blunting that process. And so that's why I'm like, if you do want to intermittent fast, then you're going to skip your dinner instead of your breakfast, because I want to have a really strong circadian rhythm, really strong leptin leptin signaling. And then at night, you're kind of doing the scarcity darkness thing and kind of getting more of what everyone talks about in the fasting world, which is autophagy and apoptosis. Right. And so Mm -hmm. it's much more powerful to do that in your sleep at night, because that's how we're biologically meant to do those processes. And I think something that is very important for fasting that people don't think about if they're going to do intermittent fasting, it's very important from what I learned from the friend of Dr. Rimka, his name was James Hobson. He was amazing, Mm -hmm. but he was saying, you need to make sure that you're getting all your nutrients in. So it's Mm -hmm. not just Mm -hmm. two meals. If you were eating less, spreading it out, you really need to make sure you're getting in those building blocks, like the fuel that you need during that time. It's not just like have a donut or you know, people can lose weight eating unhealthy things because Mm -hmm. they're intermittent fasting, but really making sure that nutrition is high quality. And I don't believe in skipping any macronutrients. I think it's going to, it's going to change. Maybe there's a season where we need more of one or the other, but I absolutely agree with a protein rich breakfast. I just feel so much better Mm -hmm. when I, when I start that. And then I notice I have more of an appetite. So we're breaking the fast. Is that good for our metabolism to eat breakfast? And if we're skipping it, is that harming our metabolism? I think it can be negative because again, there's the cortisol issue. Cortisol can become too high. And then if you have too much cortisol, you are going to stop that conversion in the thyroid. It's going to slow it down in the thyroid. And so eventually it will slow down your metabolism, right? If you're constantly spiking cortisol way too high because you're waking up, doing a fasted workout, having coffee instead of eating, and you've just got this super stressful, like cortisol filled morning happening constantly, it's going to mess up those cortisol patterns, which can mess up your sleep. But ultimately having your cortisol go way too high is going to impact that thyroid conversion. So that's what I see a lot of people that do this end up with low T3. And And I had that issue. When you say thyroid conversion, you're saying conversion of T4 to T3 in the liver. Yes. And that's what a lot of people are taking Synthroid, which is T4. Mm -hmm. Doctors are testing T4, TSH. We're not saying that's wrong, but just because your T4 is better on paper, it doesn't actually mean that you're Mm -hmm. feeling better or that your body has what it needs because of that conversion. So what you're saying is that 
light and making sure we're nourishing ourselves properly and all these things allow the body to do deeper functions so that it, everything can work as it's supposed to. It's not just take this pill. Sometimes there's more that needs to be done after that's given. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how I see people doing these really crazy calorie restricted diets and, you know, skipping the breakfast and working out really hard and actually like gaining weight. And then you've got all these kind of like bro diet fitness people out there who make fun of this, you know, and I don't want to name any names, but there are some pretty popular fitness influencers out there that they make fun of people that say they're gaining weight out of nowhere. And they're like, oh, these these people are lazy. They're lying about what they're actually eating, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, you, you can really, really slow down your metabolism and and mess things up when you're kind of doing this to your body for sure. I'm glad you brought that up because I'll tell a personal story, not here to name any names. It's just the lesson that I learned, but in working in the hospital, you know, I would have some patients who were four or 500 pounds and I saw Mm -hmm. what they're eating. Is it healthy? No, but they're not eating like five times what I'm eating in a day. It's just the quality, the light, you know, all these things. So I think there's more to it than just diet and movement. Those are very, very important, but I think there's more to it. And my story was 2017 before I went to the biohacking conference, I hired a coach. I was on a very restricted diet. It was the same exact thing for two weeks, breakfast, lunch, dinner had to be at a certain time. My snack was in the morning, in the afternoon. And I also had to do an hour of cardio every single day. It didn't matter if I was working 12 and a half hours in the hospital. So I would essentially get up at four o'clock in the morning, do my hour of cardio fasted already just so drained and depleted eating this very restricted diet. And I actually blew up 30 pounds heavier than what I am today. And it's just so interesting. So if diet and exercise are all that it requires, well, I was doing those things and I gained weight. So why would someone even if it's not fat and they're gaining weight, what could that weight gain really be coming from? If it's not just fat, what's happening? The body is losing energy. And that's like what you just mentioned about those patients that are like four or 500 pounds and they're not eating 30,000 calories a day. You're not watching them gorge themselves, but they're huge. When you are overweight, obesity, any kind of swelling or inflammation is a sign that your body is losing energy, you know, and Cruz talks about this, about how, you know, what happens when a star is dying, it explodes. What happens when you sprain your ankle, it swells up huge. Like all the blood rushes to that spot. You know, what happens to people when they're having heart failure, the heart, it, it, it gets big, you know? And so any sort of inflammation expansion is a sign that your body is losing energy in Mm -hmm. some way. And, and it's definitely a sign of leptin resistance. So leptin is supposed, is a, it's supposed to dock to the hypothalamus every night between 12 and two and give an, like a download of energy information. Hey, I've got this amount of energy on my body. So tomorrow thyroid do this hormones, do this, you know, all, like giving your body instructions. So leptin impacts, uh, thyroid insulin, sex hormones, all of these things are, dependent upon this leptin hypothalamus conversation that's supposed to happen every night. And so when people are expanding and inflamed and having this issue, I know that they're definitely leptin resistant. So that communication is not happening. That download of information is not happening and there's an issue where they're losing energy, right? Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned this, but for me, it was inflammation. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people think that weight gain is fat. Maybe it's also inflammation, especially if you're losing a lot of weight quickly. Are you losing muscle? Are you losing fat? Are you losing water weight? Which essentially inflammation is, let's say you, I I won't take credit from this. I, I read it in a book somewhere, but let's say you bang your leg on the table and mm-hmm. you're going to get a bruise. It's going to swell and mm-hmm. it's a signal. Hey, protect this area mm-hmm. and it will heal. But if you're banging your arm on that table, breakfast, lunch, and dinner three times a day. Like if you're constantly doing the things that are creating inflammation, then it's not going to get a chance to heal. And we're in chronic inflammation. And I think so many people Mm -hmm. that's their home percent, and they just don't realize it. So, you know, leptin and ghrelin, those might be new for a lot of people here. And even backing up a little bit, a lot of people 
myself included, I never considered blood sugar because my A1C, which is the average over three months was Mm -hmm. good, but that doesn't mean Mm -hmm. it's not all, all over the place. Right. And my fasting glucose was also very good, but my blood sugar was all over the place. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people focus on, do I have diabetes? No, then my blood sugar is good. Okay. The next level would be, okay, my blood sugar is good. Like, like I had, but what's going on with my insulin levels. Mm -hmm. And most people don't get their fasting insulin checked. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And so insulin resistance, we're hearing a lot more about that, but you talk a lot about leptin resistance. So for Mm -hmm. a lot of people, they're probably like, what's that? So leptin and ghrelin, this is just my understanding, but leptin is what keeps us full. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. So Mm -hmm. if we're not sleeping, then how can our hormones function properly? And just how will leptin and ghrelin be thrown off if we're not implementing these foundational pieces. Right. Well, yeah. Le- I mean, leptin, like I said, is kind of like the accountant that like takes a stock of what's on the body and gives directions to your brain every night when you're sleeping. So if you're not sleeping, that's not happening. And leptin resistance actually happens before insulin resistance. Okay. And so a lot of people might have borderline, like their fasting blood sugar might be like 90s, 100, 105, you know, but they're not pre-diabetic. They get their fasting insulin done and it's really nothing to be concerned about, but they have 30 extra pounds, right? Or 20 extra pounds or they, they're, they're just all over the map with hunger. There's usually a leptin resistance issue. And so you test your leptin 12 hours fasted in the morning around eight o'clock is usually the best time, 12 to 14 hours. You don't want to go too long. You don't want to be it to be too little, but I like women between a seven and a 10 and men usually is between zero to four, but you, you want those ideal numbers because that means that that energy information download is actually happening. And my leptin was actually super low when I was trying to get pregnant because I had been doing keto and carnivore for years with no carbs at all Mm -hmm. and tons of fasting. And so my body thought I was starving to death, even though I had extra weight, my mm-hmm. body literally thought I was like starving to death. And so my leptin was like super low. And so most people are not going to be in that situation. Most people are going to have elevated leptin, but it does happen. It happens a lot more now that people are starting to do keto and carnivore as more of like a long-term kind of a lifestyle diet. And so again, leptin resistance happens before insulin resistance. It's a, it's a precursor. And so you might not be insulin resistant and you may not have like crazy blood sugar numbers. You may not be pre-diabetic, but you can absolutely be leptin resistant. How do you get that checked? Because I use a service I'm looking right now. It's called Mm requestatest.com. And that is a direct to consumer service where you can order a lot of these tests. Even my doctor will order a thyroid panel and Mm -hmm. I will just go to request a test and get those same exact things checked to follow up. If there's something abnormal, I can bring it to her, but where are people getting their leptin levels checked? Do they need to go to their doctor to do it? Are doctors ordering this? Is there a way they can do it on their own and share it with their doctor? If it's abnormal yeah. walk-in lab is what I used. Cause my doctor wouldn't order it for me, even though I was like going to this really expensive fertility doctor. She's like, you don't need that one. Insurance isn't going to pay blah, 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 but it's just a fasting blood serum leptin test. And I, okay. I, I bet request a test would probably have it. They 69 at lab core and 85 at quest. How much is yeah. it from, is that about what you pay for walk-in this? lab? I think it's a similar. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty similar. Yeah. So yeah, you can just order it yourself, but you just want to do it, you know, morning time, 12 to 14 hours fasted. Don't over fast, you know, because then it can make it a little Bit, bit lower than it should be, but yeah, that's, that's easy to test yourself. Interesting. So, and, and it's great to get baseline data. You know, mm-hmm. I don't see any of this as living in fear. It's just baseline mm-hmm. data. Where am I? So if something changes, I know where I was and I can, I can compare. So mm-hmm. I like to keep records of all of my, my labs. And I will also say that for lab core and quest, the reference ranges Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. They'll tell you it's normal. If you're, I've had people come to me like, well, my leptin is 25, but my doctor said that's normal for, for me. And I'm like, no, (laughs) that means you're very leptin resistant. If you're 25, like that's not good at all. So this is interesting. It's basing the range is based on BMI and the unit is uh, nanograms per milliliter. Is that because you said, I believe seven to 10. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. This says 1.5 as a result here. So, yeah. I mean, for men, it can be between zero and four and it's okay. So men, their leptin runs a bit lower and that's probably, it's, I mean, it's probably based on what you would look for, for a man. But for, if a woman came to me with a 1.5, uh, that's low. That's okay. low. Yeah. So is nanograms per milliliter, the same unit mm-hmm. that you're, you're speaking about for the seven to 10. Yeah. Okay. So I'll have to get this checked because I've actually never checked it to see. So it's just really interesting. These things can just help us rule things out. Okay. Maybe mm-hmm. that's not an issue. Maybe it right. is. And I'm spending 50 to a hundred thousand on IVF when maybe there once again are just more foundational things that we can be doing. Mm-hmm. So tell me what does a typical day look like for you? I know that you're a mom of mm-hmm. your son just turned one. Yeah. So a lot of people say, I'm a parent. I can't do these things. Mm-hmm. Well, you're a parent and Mm -hmm. I don't know how many hours you work. I know you might have more flexibility if you work from home, but you found Mm -hmm. a way to make it work. So I think you can really help guide other people who are parents. I am not, but what does a typical day look like for you? An optimal day. Yeah. So optimal, I would wake up around sunrise. I know my son has actually been, he sleeps until about sunrise. Sometimes after this morning, he was asleep till like almost nine. I was like, what is going on? But babies and children, they need, they need to sleep longer. And so I don't wake him up, but I wake up and I literally, if, if, you know, I put on a pair of blue blockers, I keep them on my nightstand, walk downstairs, open the door and get sunlight. Luckily my backyard is facing sunrise. And so I can go out in the backyard, do some grounding, get some sunlight, and then I will leave the door open or cracked so that we're getting natural light coming into our house. We have tons of windows on the backside of our house. So we've got a beautiful ton of natural light, but you do have to have the window open or a door cracked because windows do block out Mm -hmm. red near infrared and UV like on purpose. So you're not getting, you're mostly getting blue light. If you're just relying on windows to, to, to give you that circadian signal, it's pure blue light. And so you have to actually go outside and get that natural signal. So for me, you know, my ideal morning is out there sunrise and then grabbing some breakfast sitting outside, eating breakfast, even if it's cold, I cold adapt. So I do this every day, year round. And I do live in Atlanta, Georgia. So it's doesn't get like, I mean, it gets 30 degrees here. It gets cold mm-hmm. here, yeah. but by the, by the time it's 30 degrees, I'm used to going outside every day. And it's not a shock to my system. I've been cold adapting. As soon as it starts getting cold, I'm outside barefoot. You know, I'm outside in my pajamas still every morning. So that's really my ideal morning is getting those two things in. And then whatever the day takes for me with the kids or work or whatever, trying to take natural light breaks to go outside. I have my computer. So I'm in my office right now. So my window is open. I have two huge windows in front of me. So I don't have to use a ring light. My old office, I had to use a ring light because, you know, podcasting and you, it looks better if you have a nice big light in front of you, but I have two huge windows in front of me. One of them is open. And I just try to, like I said, I, I make it a game as much as I can of like, oh, can I go outside barefoot for five minutes right now? Because the, the effects of grounding are cumulative. Okay. So the studies that have been done on grounding, it's like to get a benefit that reduces inflammation, you want to get 45 minutes a day, but most people aren't going to have time to do that at once. And so again, yeah, like, do I have five minutes? Can I go sit outside barefoot or can I take this call outside? Or can I do that? Like, I'm always just trying to play a little game. Can I peek my head out the door so that I'm just not stuck inside all day? I have my house set up with light bulbs that are around 1600 Kelvin, like lower Kelvin, which is closer to sunrise and sunset. We have lamps instead of overhead lights because the overhead, you know, like when I was staying yeah. at my uncle's house, I was like eight o'clock at night and he had these huge bright, you know, overhead lights. And I was like, ah, I just felt like super, like it, it just yeah. felt jarring to my nervous system. And so lamps are helpful. So I kind of just have things set up in the house to, to live this more circadian friendly lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I try to keep it as simple as I possibly can. Okay. So things that, you know, big takeaways go outside before looking at your phone. Oh, we've also talked about the hatch light. You don't recommend that because Mm -mm. of the flickering. So if you need an alarm clock or if you need a clock and you're like me, where if the phone's there, you're going to look at it. Mm -hmm. There are analog clocks that you can use. Is there a company that you like for that? 
Yeah. Tech wellness has a really great one. That's low EMF and uh, circadian friendly. And the other reason I don't like the hatch light again is because it's artificial light before sunlight. And so any artificial light is telling your body make cortisol. And you really want that signal as much as you possibly can to be coming from sunrise and that amount of blue light that our bodies need is present in sunlight to start to turn on the HPA and HPG axis. So that's super important to try to get that signal from outside. And you know what it's Carrie and I, our episode this last week was about trying to be perfect because you can't do this perfectly in the modern world. You're going to have a partner that turns on the overhead lights or TV or whatever, like stuff's going to happen. You're going to have a kid that is, you know, having issues and you got to deal with it and you can't be outside and you just can't stress out about it because stress can cause more damage to your hormones and your body than missing that perfect amount of light and having that blast of blue light at the wrong time. You have to take an attitude of like, this is cumulative, like just get Mm -hmm. a little bit better every day. And if I only got like two minutes of sunlight today, maybe I can get 10 minutes tomorrow or, you know, it does kind of even itself out. It is the benefits are cumulative, like grounding. They, they can even themselves out. And so I tell people don't stress out about it, do your best. And the more that you start to do these things, the better you're going to feel. And it's going to be like something that's just easy for you. It might seem really hard at first, but once you begin to do it, it does just really become easy. Yes. And thank you for mentioning that too, because, you know, I'm a recovering perfectionist with cigarettes and I was smoking two packs a day as a teen. I got down to three and my therapist is like, the stress you're putting on yourself is probably worse than those three cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I'm doing my best and my best got better over time. So thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. So in wrapping up, I just have a question. Well, two questions about blue blockers and red light at night. So you will put on blue blockers in the morning if it's still dark out, if you wake up before the sun comes Mm -hmm. out. Okay. You will wear them outside as well because I never wear them outside. Mm -hmm. No, never wear them outside. You were just saying in the car, if you're driving to work. If you're driving to work. Yeah. And you've got a bunch of headlights and it's dark out and you've got headlights coming at you because those lights are super bright. Okay. And then again, the light coming in through the windshield is going to be blue light. Okay. Yeah. But if you have a window cracked, right. And you're driving and the sun is coming up, then you take the glasses off, crack the window, open the sunroof. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that's a a good clarification because for me, I wear them when I'm inside. I don't wear them when I'm outside Mm -mm. and then always after dark. I mean, I'm religious Mm -hmm. about that. I do watch TV at night. Mm -hmm. I know it's probably not good, but I I do always. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's not every night, but like, okay. Maybe once a week or so. I mean, just mostly because my kids don't allow it. Yeah. And I'm usually just so tired by the time I get them down that I'm just like, I got to go to bed or lay in the, t- I'd rather lay in the tub than watch TV at this stage in my life. But I know people are going to watch TV. So wear your red blue blockers or wear your blue blockers, you know, cover up your thyroid with a blanket and because your skin has photoreceptors. So yeah. Yeah. I, under- I know people are going to do that. So just try to wear yeah. your blue blockers. Exactly. It's like making better choices versus striving for perfection, feeling overwhelmed and say, screw it all. There is exactly, exactly. keep doing your best. Thank you so much for, for really hammering that home. Okay. And then one question that I got is about red light at night Mm -hmm. and that you had recently suggested not doing it at that time. So Mm -hmm. please explain to me. I mean, I prefer to do it in the morning. I always Mm -hmm. thought night was better. So this is great news for me, but why would you say that? And what do you think about using it in the middle of the day? Yeah. Middle of the day is great. I think any, I always tell people anytime the sun is up is fine because that, um, near infrared is available. Anytime the sun is up, right. Red is most prominent and red also, but red is the most prominent at sunrise and at sunset. Um, so those are good times to do it, but there are studies that show that super bright red light, even if it's in that therapeutic wavelength, that that can actually stop the production of melatonin. So we really, really of pineal melatonin, right? Because our body (laughs) melatonin is a really fascinating topic. We make it during the day in response to near infrared light from sunlight or from a red light panel. It's a subcellular melatonin, but pineal melatonin, we want to start making that. And we only make that in response to darkness. And so if you're shining red light on your skin, on your body, doing a body treatment, after sunset, 
I find a lot of people can have interrupted sleep. Now, this isn't true for everyone. And my husband doesn't listen to me. My husband will do the red light <laughs> after dark. He does everything that I say not to do. They never want to, we don't want to ever hear it from our partner. He doesn't want to hear it from me. Yeah. I'm like, that's fine. I'll just teach people who want to know, <laughs> but you do what you, you do you. And he doesn't have the problem sleeping when he does the red light after sunset. But I have had a lot of people do it after sunset and have issue sleeping because it's stopping that pineal melatonin from beginning to be made. And we make that in response to darkness. And so there is one study that I, that I found that shows even red light in those therapeutic ranges, if it's too bright can actually stop that melatonin release. And here's the thing about light bulbs. Cause I teach in my courses, like you know, at night, if you need light bulbs, use a red light bulb or use incandescent or use one that's like 1600, 1700 Kelvin, right? There are some people that I have, they use a red light bulb and they get angry, right? Or they don't feel good. And I'm like, "Mm, don't use those because your body is having a negative reaction to this light. And so it's all bio-individual. Yes. The biggest thing that to remember is you want as much darkness after sunset as you can get but some of us have kids. We want to watch TV. Like you just have to kind of do damage control sometimes. And so I run, I get a lot of people that want to do everything perfectly and they want to have the routine perfect and this and the other. And they're like, but you know, I have the red light bulb and I feel angry or I still feel like super stimulated. And I'm like, well, then maybe don't use the red light bulb, use like an amber colored one and see if you feel better with that. So it is individual. I, I can make like more general statements, but you have to kind of test things out for yourself because you might do red light therapy after dark and sleep like a baby, but I have worked with a ton of people. And then there is that scientific literature that shows mm, it, it can stop that pineal melatonin from secreting. Okay. So something to, especially if you have an aura ring or some type of feedback mm-hmm. device, try it out different times of the day and see. But when I was in Hilton Head, which is where I grew up, I saw a sign on the beach that said only use red light at night because of the turtles. It's like Mm. a huge thing there to preserve wildlife. And I just thought that was so interesting that they made that distinction yet for humans, red light. I mean, it's not so woo woo anymore, but it's like a fact for animals. We need to make sure we're not shining this, you know, bright white light on them at night. Right. Right. Right think about that for ourselves. And I use red light as ambient light. Like I'll use my panel in the background when I'm taking a bath at night, but I just don't put it directly onto my skin or my body because again, we have those photoreceptors on the body. So that's where I think people get confused. It's like, I'm not going to do an actual red light therapy treatment on my body after sunset. If I'm going to do a red light therapy treatment on my body, it's going to be during daylight hours. Okay. And then last question. So it's not going to confuse the body. If we have most blue light in the middle of the day, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't do red light during that time. I would try to do it more in the morning. So yeah. why is that still okay? If our body would be consuming more blue light, typically around midday, just because our bodies are so red light deficient, okay, in general and near infrared deficient, because we're just living these indoor lives, you know, like people are not going outside. We get near infrared. Like I said, it's 42% of the sun in the middle of the day. Um, So we would naturally be getting that if we were outdoors, even if we're in the shade, it it bounces off of trees and we can get it even in the shade. So, but most people are not going outside. And so we are so near infrared and red light deficient. That's why I think it's fine if people want to do it in the middle of the day. Perfect. That makes so much sense. Well, I've learned a lot. You know, this is something I'm passionate about, but I would love to take one of your courses and learn more myself. So how can people take your courses? How can they find you? Because you are such a wealth of knowledge. And once again, there are things where the the best example was the the hatch light I just asked. Mm -hmm. And you you lovingly shared your thoughts without any attachment to me thinking like you or choosing it. And I just really, really respect and appreciate that. So if more people come to you, I think that you're just such a, a great person and you practice Aww. what you preach. So yeah. How can people find you and work with you or take Thank one of your you. courses? Yeah. It's my website is the best way to find me. It's just www.sarahkleinerwellness.com courses, podcast, all my links are on the website. I'm also on Instagram as at Sarah Kleiner wellness. Again, all this can be found on my website, but my podcast is called the evolving wellness podcast. And my YouTube channel is just a Sarah Kleiner wellness YouTube channel. So yeah. 
Amazing. All right. Well, we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. And is there anything that you want to share before we go? Any like big takeaway you want people to remember? Yeah, I think just don't uh, discount that. Like I said, don't discount the simplicity of it. And this is really, really powerful stuff that can really, really improve your health. And it's just super foundational. So if you're spinning your wheels right now in regards to health, and you're just kind of on this, like supplement this and try that and try that. This is something that is easy and it's pretty much free to implement. And so don't discount it because of that. Um, it is really, really super powerful. And I think that's the one thing I want people to walk away with is like, huh, there's an empowerment aspect to all of this as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. I love this episode and I hope it provided some value to the listeners. So if you learned anything, let us know. And thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the High Maintenance Hippie podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and leave a review, ideally a five-star review if you loved it. All of this is free of charge and really helps me to be able to run the podcast. If you take a screenshot and tag me, I'll repost you and shout you out on Instagram. So tag Ashley Taylor Wellness and High Maintenance Hippie podcast. If you have any feedback or guests that you'd like to have, I would love to hear from you so that I'm not just talking at you. I really want to deliver things that are valuable. So send me an email with any feedback, suggestions, or ideas for guests at ashley at ashleytaylorwellness.com. And I will leave you with a disclaimer. Please know that this is not medical advice or replacement for seeking medical care. Everything discussed on this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Always consult with your medical provider before making any changes. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time.